founder, Kinsa. Uh, with me on stage is my colleague, Zach, uh, who's going to play uh, the role of both father and son in our uh, product demonstration. <laughs> um, and I, I also want to say this is Zach's first day of working at Kinsa, so we're really excited to have him. <laughs> Imagine what we as a society could do if we could track the spread of disease in real time. Uh, for those of you scratching your head saying, can't we do that already, the answer is no, we're not even close. So two years ago, we started Kinsa with a mission to create the world's first real-time map of human health to track and stop the spread of disease. We thought to ourselves, how can we begin a communication with someone who has just fallen ill to give them value, to help them get better faster, while at the same time collecting information to map human health. So to do that, we reimagined and revolutionized uh, the world's most common medical device. Uh, this is the world's smartest thermometer. Uh, I'm very excited that it got FDA approved about a month ago, so we're just launching it. So I'd like to show you uh, how it works. Um, so uh, Zach is going to demonstrate, and uh, he's going to be using an optional extension cord uh, for demonstration purposes. Imagine that your five-year-old has uh, gotten ill, so you take the Kinsa Smart Thermo right now, and you take his time. <laughs> so as you can see, we've created a fun, engaging screen for both parent and child. Um, Zach's going to show you the uh, gravitational effects of the bubbles as he's taking his temperature. And, and he's got a reasonably a a a average temperature. He's a li little cool, but uh, for, for those of you that don't know, everyone has actually a slightly different set point in terms of their temperature, and this is one of the kind of devices that you can use to track that as well. So you can know if you have an infection um, a little bit better, perhaps, than other thermometers. Um, so you saw during that screen that it not only was engaging, but we showed um, progress along a temperature reading. We actually show if it falls out of your mouth. And there's other things that we can do because of a smartphone that you can't do with an ordinary thermometer. Um, so Zach's going to show you that with a few simple taps, you can track your symptoms over time um, and even share that with your spouse or with your uh, pediatrician. Um, whenever you, when you go to the pediatrician's office and they ask, um, you know, what, what, what was the temperature and how did symptoms progress over time? Now you have your phone in your pocket and you can pull it out and you can show them right then and there. So uh, you see that your child has a generally okay temperature but it's exhibiting some symptoms. Uh, you're concerned that they're getting sick from somebody, uh, probably another kid, so you go and check the health at your child's school. Here you see the private group that you joined with other mothers of your child's first grade class. You see that four out of 24 kids are ill and strep throat's going around. So that causes you concern, so you look for the nearest urgent care facility with an appointment. And this is the kind of triage functionality that we can provide through the app. Um, so even if you haven't joined a private group, you can see the local health situation. Here you see it on a map. And this is a picture of San Francisco. Uh, we only have some beta testers, so this is um, fake hour data with uh, lots of other data from the CDC and else. And you can see that the Mission District is not looking so good. I don't know what the startups out there are doing, but not looking so good. And so this is a more descriptive picture of the Mission District. This is what we like to call the health weather. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you a real-time understanding of what's going around to empower you with the information to make decisions. So um, that's uh, a bit about the product. Um, you know, earlier we said that this was the world's smartest thermometer. Uh, we also uh, know that it's one of the world's least expensive thermometers. So um, we've used, and now the reason for that is we've used the smartphone intelligently. So we're using the display, the power, and the processing capabilities of the smartphone. That means that there's no batteries, there's no LCD, there's no processor required in the, therm in the, in the actual thermometer. And this is the actual PCB board. I, I know it's so small you guys can't see it. But it's tiny, right? There's six resistors and a capacitor for those of you that are electrical engineers. There's nothing to it, really. Um, and it's really all the processing power on the phone. Um, in addition to it being uh, cheaper than most thermometers and smarter than most thermometers, we also think of it as one of the most beautiful thermometers ever made. Um, and it comes in this really cool case, which I don't have with me. It's uh, sitting down there. Um, I'll show it to you in a moment. And um, the actual design of the, uh, of the product, it's, it's very, because it's so small and there's nothing to it, it can be highly, highly flexible, which is really comfortable, especially for kids. Um, so that's the product. Um, and so um, you may also be asking yourselves now, how, how did you come up with this idea? <laughs> um, so I'll tell you the brief story about that. Um, in 2011, I fell really, really ill. Um, I, uh, my fever would not go below 104, uh, despite the medicines, and I failed two antibiotic regimens. And, um, you know, uh, 
I was delirious, it was the sixth day and I was delirious, so I started searching online, looking around, doing Google search queries, checking social media, media mining, um, and, and, and started thinking to myself, somebody else has to have this illness because it was clearly an infectious disease, it was flu-like symptoms, um, maybe they can tell me how they got better. Um, and I found zero. And it struck me that even in the greatest country in the world, even this, in this highly connected society in which we live, we have, we're still in the dark ages when it comes to understanding the health situation around us. And dis that's despite so much rich, real-time access to other data for other aspects of our lives. Um, I can't live without Google Maps and Waze today. In fact, I used it to get here, as I bet many of you did. Um, and yet I have zero access to this most important aspect of our lives, the health, health in our communities. Um, so, um, now I was very fortunate at the time, uh, I was working at the Clinton Foundation and um, had been working in public health for a long time. Uh, I had the uh, really great pleasure and honor of being the guy who brokered the deals uh, that President Clinton announced on lower priced AIDS and malaria drugs overseas. So clearly I was in the industry, right? And it got me thinking about this problem in a much deeper way. Um, and uh, I thought to myself, well, I couldn't find information, but there's gotta be something out there. There's gotta be something out there to track the spread of disease in real time. Um, and what I uncovered was very interesting. So a little bit of context. 90% uh, of the seven billion people on the planet are affected by infectious disease each year. Um, it's certainly, um, whether that's strep throat or the flu or something far more serious than that, TB, malaria, HIV, et cetera. Um, but, um, and with that, we spend trillions of dollars on trying to stop the spread of infectious disease, trying to treat it, trying to prevent it, et cetera. Despite that, there's really not that much out there. So what I found, um, you know, I started with the basics. I looked at the two most prominent healthcare organizations in the world, the World Health Organization and the United States Centers for Disease Control. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, what do you do? You've got to have some sophisticated means to track the spread of disease. What I found was that the gold standard was physician reported um, illnesses. So in the United States, uh, the U.S. Center for Disease Control has the system where they try to get doctors to report illness. It's very sparse, and one thing that I uncovered is that by the time they collect data, aggregate it, and can actually visualize it, visualize it, it's four weeks after the fact. Four weeks after the flu season has started, everyone in that area is already affected by the flu. So, you know, it's not really a real-time system, but certainly has very high, you know, as they would say in the data world, signal to noise, right? It's, it's accurate because physicians are reporting. So, you know, I thought, okay, that's interesting. Seems a little primitive. We've got all this technology. There's got to be something else. So I uncovered um, this really cool and really innovative idea from Google. This is called Google Flu Trends. What Google's doing is they're taking search query data, uh, data from people still in their homes before they enter the healthcare system, because everyone uses Google, um, and they're mining the search queries to find flu-like terms. And that's how they're developing an interesting big data perspective of the flu. So really insightful, huge leap forward. Um, now the problem with this, and there's a few problems with this, I mean, one of them is that your browser's not super geolocated, so they can do it on a regional level, but they can't do it more than that. Um, and much, much more importantly, is you have these challenges with mining the data. So, as you can see here, you know, I have a fever. Obviously, that's an indication of some sort of illness. However, if you have Bieber fever, um, it may not be. And so, that, that's, the, that's the kind of challenge that you see with natural language processing. <laughs> So this idea has been extended. So it's not just Google search queries that are doing this now. Now there's also you're also mining social media. Again, you still have the same kinds of challenges. Um, a lot of people tweet from their phones, so it's it's generally a little bit more geolocated, but you still have these natural language processing and signal signal to noise errors. Um, so you know, this was the state of the art when we started, and uh, you know, really innovative, insightful things. And we thought to ourselves, well, there's gotta be more you can do because what's missing from the equation, what's fundamentally missing from the equation is real-time, highly geolocated, medically accurate data. With that data, you can probably draw a lot more insight from Google, a lot more insight from the social media, and do a lot more things with the CDC data. But that was the fundamental missing part. And so that's where we came up with the thermometer. So some of you may still be asking yourselves, so I don't get it, the thermometer. I don't really get it, right? So, you know, what we showed you earlier was what we believe is a beautiful design that people will use that will allow us to get real-time geolocated fever data, symptom data, and we're reimagining what a thermometer is. So just like Apple um, started by recreating the phone, 
And oh, by the way, for those of you that don't know, um, uh, talking on the phone is now number five on the list of what, how you use a smartphone, number five. It's no longer a phone, right? And that's the same idea with a thermometer. We're extending the meaning of it. The first thing that a parent in particular does um, when they find that their child is ill after you know, comforting them after, if, you can, if, they're, if they're of an age that they can speak, talking to them about the symptoms, is they take out, the first gadget they get out is the thermometer. So we're piggybacking off of that idea and we're extending the meaning to give you help. But the key point here is that we're leveraging an existing behavior. We are piggybacking off the most widespread medical behavior in the world. A parent taking a child's temperature at the earliest that that child is exhibiting an illness. And I'll add two or three points. Um, children have, for those of you that are parents, you know that children are germ machines. Children happen to be the primary vector, for this, uh, vector is not the appropriate word, the primary spreader of uh, most infectious diseases, um, especially in Western society. So if you know what's happening in the children population, you can predict what's gonna happen in the broader adult population about a week later. That's a simplified view of it, but that's one key point. And so that's one of the reasons that we started with the thermometer. The other point here is that parents happen to be power users of existing thermometers. So we wanted to create a better product. Um, so that's the story behind uh, the thermometer. But and now we've shown you a little bit about how we can track, potentially track, as long as we get widespread uptake of the product, how we can potentially track the spread of things like flu. But there are also more devastating diseases um, that um, we can potentially um, uh, avoid. So, um, let's see here. There we go. Um, what you see up here is a, uh, a list of three dozen uh, epidemic diseases that all had pandemic potential in the last 30 years. So each one of these diseases did or could have killed between 1 million and 10 million people. These all had pandemic potential. And there are um, some of them that are, have been big global scares, even in recent years. Um, so many of you are aware of SARS and swine flu. I bet many of you were not aware of the 1918 Spanish flu, which affected nearly one in four people globally and killed one in six infected. That year, which was the first year of World War I, and a lot of people attribute uh, many of the deaths globally to World War I, and that's true, but a lot of people died from the Spanish flu. One strain, of the flu killed um, uh, massive numbers of people globally. So that's the kind of thing that we can also work on is trying to avoid and try to early detect and early respond to pandemic threats. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just uh, quickly summarize. Um, what we've built, we believe, will help transform the way that parents take care of their families. We've built a product that we believe will help transform the way parents take care of their families. And we're building a system where crowdsourced data, your data, will help to save lives. Join us, and together, let's revolutionize health for seven billion people starting right here in the United States. Thanks for your time.